Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Research America Alliance member meeting. And let me start by uh, first thanking you for being members as always. And second, um, thanks to the many of you who submitted comments to us, uh, quotes, examples, insights about the impact of COVID-19 on our research ecosystem. Um, we have compiled them. We're sending them out this afternoon. Um, more on that later. Um, but today I'm so thrilled um, to um, introduce two guest speakers. And um, just after a bit of housekeeping, I'll, um, I'll get to that. You, I think you all know we're on Zoom webinar. So right now you're on mute. Um, you can always use the um, Q&A box at any time to ask a question. You could also um, raise your hand if you have a question. Oh, golly. Um, sorry, all, I didn't realize I was off camera. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I, uh, where was I? Was I talking about using the Q&A function, I think, and raising your hand um, if you have questions throughout. So we're gonna hear from uh, Sarah Eggy and Rob Smith to talk about um, two different facets of um, federal legislation this year. The first is, we're in the thick of it, the budget resolution and the reconciliation process that um, the majorities in the House and Senate are using um, to try to pass a supplemental bill. And then Rob is gonna cover some of the um, other issues in policy this year, PDUFA, 21st Century Cures, um, there's an interim final rule on drug pricing, some other issues like that. So um, as you, I think you can see their titles on the screen and I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. I'm gonna turn to Sarah and thanks so much for joining us, Sarah. Excellent. I'm so excited to be here today to speak with you about the budget process and hopefully demystify for some of you um, what, what exactly the, this budget resolution reconciliation process is all about. So taking a quick step back, um, as envisioned in statute, um, the, the budget process is normally kicks off in February with the submission of the president's budget which Congress then get, considers via a budget resolution. Um, and I'll get into the components of a budget resolution in a moment. But one of the components of a budget resolution is reconciliation instructions. And to the extent reconciliation instructions are included, um, then the next step in the process after a budget resolution is adopted by both chambers is to work towards enabling those instructions that were included in the budget resolution. Um, then throughout the, the remainder of the year, the budget committee uh, is enforcing the levels and aggregates that are included in the budget resolution uh, with every piece of legislation that moves through the process. Um, and, you know, there are also some statutory uh, budget provisions as well, um, such as sequestration under statutory PEGA, and we'll get into that a little bit too. But we are in fast forward this year because we are going to end up doing, by all accounts, two budget resolutions and potentially the authorizing committees will be carrying out at least two sets of reconciliation instructions. So what's happening on the Hill right now is today the House will be voting on its version of the FY21 budget resolution. In fact, this is why we can do two different budget resolutions this year because Congress never did a budget resolution last year. So they are now taking that option and moving forward very quickly um, with, with the FY21 budget resolution. But the House will be voting on that later today. Um, the Senate started its debate yesterday on the resolution. Um, they are expect in the, in the Senate, the rules uh, allow up to 50 hours of debate, although some of that can be yielded back by um, both parties. And then at the end, uh, senators can offer as many amendments as they want. This is often called a votorama. Um, you know, because uh, a, a budget resolution is a privileged vehicle, it only requires a simple majority vote in, in the Senate. Uh, members are allowed to offer as many amendments as they would like to that budget resolution as sort of, a, you know, sort of an offset to the fact that they, they, they have a, a limit on the debate. But what does a budget resolution include and why is it so important? So a couple of elements that are included in a budget resolution are top line spending aggregates, revenue levels, deficit levels, and debt levels. Um, a budget resolution may also include reconciliation instructions and a reconciliation instruction is a directive to a committee 
to achieve a particular budgetary outcome um, that's specified in those reconciliation instructions. Uh, in the particular budget resolutions that are being considered in the House and the Senate this week, um, I think it's 12 committees were instructed in the House and 11 committees were constructed in the Senate um, to achieve uh, legislation that increases the deficit by a particular amount. And if you kind of add it up across all of the committees, it amounts to about 1.9 trillion, which was the target number um, proposed by President Biden in his American Rescue Plan. Um, the committees are instructed to report uh, legislation that you know implements those uh, or achieves those those uh, deficit increasing targets by February 16th. So this is going to be a very rapid turnaround. House committees are are planning to mark up next week that subsequent legislation, um, and um, you know the budget committee's role in all of this is to sort of compile all of the reconciliation instructions it receives from the authorizing committees and move that to the floor in both the House and the Senate. Uh, another important component of a budget resolution is reserve funds. So reserve funds are um, a way for the chairman of the budget committee to exercise their authority to raise spending levels, lower revenue levels, uh, change deficit and debt levels, to accommodate uh, the reconciliation legislation or really any legislation that's moving through um, that meets the specifics of the reserve fund and therefore avoid what would otherwise be 60 vote points of order um, and sort of removing hurdles um, from you know, moving forward on in particular a reconciliation piece of legislation with a simple 50 votes. Um, there are also often points of order, either new ones created or sometimes exceptions um, to allow certain kinds of legislation to avoid points of order in a budget resolution. If you look at the Senate budget resolution that's being considered right now, for example, uh, there are provisions that essentially exempt any reconciliation legislation that meets the instructions um, from a Senate PAYGO point of order and a short-term and long-term deficit point of order that would otherwise exist against any, any bill that goes through the House or the Senate. Um, so the resolution is supposed to be adopted, um, you know, probably today, later today in the House and probably Thursday, maybe Friday in the Senate. It is possible that there will be differences between those two resolutions. So what will happen is the House will end up having to vote a second time on the Senate budget resolution. And once the resolution has been adopted in the same form by both chambers, thereby you know, avoiding a what we would typically think of as a conference, then the budget resolution is in force and the committees can go forth next week with starting to draft those reconciliation instructions. Hey, so um, can I just interrupt you for one yeah. moment with a question? Um, you mentioned um, point of order. I just wanna make sure that our audience knows that that basically, well, actually I should let you explain, but like, right, basically it just means that someone would say this actually doesn't work within the rules of, of this process, so it can't be included, right? And so- Yes, there are, yes, that's exactly right. So the, the way the, the levels um, are, are enforced in a budget resolution are through various points of order. Um, and in the Senate, it requires 60 votes to waive a point of order generally. Um, that's why it's so important to have a reserve fund and to you know allow for, um, you know, certain legislation to avoid points of order because you could then turn a 50 vote vehicle into a 60 vote vehicle if a point of order applied. There's also some special points of order that apply just to reconciliation uh, vehicles. And that's what limits what can be included in a reconciliation vehicle. Um, you know, originally as reconciliation was conceived, if you talk to the old budgeteers from the old days, it was really meant to be for, uh, you know, bills that required uh, tough votes. Um, it was really meant to be for deficit reduction efforts. Um, it's always it's always very difficult to, you know, pull together a sufficient number of votes to cut spending or to raise revenues. But over time, really starting in the early 2000s, that's evolved, and reconciliation has been used for a variety of pieces of legislation, primarily in the tax space, to either reduce significant surpluses as happened in 01 and 03, or to significantly increase the deficit as happened in 2017 through reconciliation. Um, 
important to note that reconciliation is really meant to be for budgetary related matters. It is not meant to be for, um, you know, sort of a catch-all vehicle to, to, to attach anything a member would like to get done with that simple majority vote. So uh, Senator Byrd back in the mid eighties um, helped develop a set of rules that are called the, the Byrd rule um, that limit what can be included in a budget resolution, I'm sorry, in a budget reconciliation bill. And it, there's really a six part test to that, um, that you know significantly limits in many ways what can be included, but the primary driver behind the bird rule is that things that are included in a budget reconciliation bill should really impact the federal budget and that should be the primary goal of those provisions. So what often happens in a budget reconciliation debate is uh, what is known as a bird bath and that is where both sides, uh, Republicans and Democrats, come together and argue in front of the parliamentarian about the Senate parliamentarian who is, you know, uh, not an elected individual, but as an employee of the Senate, um, about which components of a reconciliation bill might not meet those budgetary tests. Right. Um, you know, the kinds of things that are not to be allowed under the Byrd rule include things outside the committees of jurisdiction that were instructed, um, anything that increases the deficit beyond the budget window, which is generally 10 years. So anything that has a, a deficit increasing impact wow. outside That's the 10 year years. window, unless wow. it's paid for. So it has to be paid for wow. within, okay. within that instructed committee's title. Um, so that, that can often be a real challenge um, for making things permanent. Um, you can have some terms and conditions of a provision that may not score in and of themselves, but if they were eliminated might change the score. That's often one of those arts of, arts of the bird rule debate about whether something can be included because it's a term and condition of an underlying provision that does score. Um, and one of the other uh, components is whether a provision may have a budget impact, but its budget impact is merely incidental to what's really trying to be achieved. And there's a, a very robust debate going on right now about the minimum wage, for example, and whether you know, the, including the minimum wage really meets um, the test for being included in a reconciliation bill or not. Um, clearly there are gonna be some revenue impacts from uh, an increase in the minimum wage, but some would argue that the overall goal is really a mandate on employers and it is unrelated to the federal budget impact of that. So that is something that will be debated before the Senate parliamentarian. Um, the Senate parliamentarian advises the presiding officer in the Senate on how the bird rule is applied. And then, uh, you know, somebody can, can wait, can, you know, you know, Call, call and say, I, you know, I want to, I want to waive that. And if there's 60 votes to sort of waive a point of order, then a provision may remain in the underlying bill. Um, the, those are sort of the key components of the reconciliation process. There are a number of other um, points of order that apply, including, um, you know. Uh, or that could apply to a bill, including germaneness, for example, you've got to be, you've got to have an amendment that's germane to the underlying um, reconciliation bill in order to be allowed. But let me just pause there because there, there are sort of, we talked a little bit at the beginning of how there's gonna be two budget processes and potentially two reconciliation bills. And as I understand it, this first budget resolution reconciliation process is really meant to focus on immediate COVID relief, short term yes. provisions. And the second budget resolution, which will come later in the spring, once the you know, new president has submitted his FY22 budget, which will be his first budget that he's submitting, um, we are expecting that that second budget resolution and possibly the second reconciliation opportunity is gonna focus more on long-term infrastructure stimulus spending, but is also likely to have a healthcare component as well. A lot of the health provisions that are going to be included in the reconciliation bill, you know, during February, um, are are really short term in nature. Some public health investments, yes. some short term, you know, coverage investments. 
but they may come back in the second package and take some of those coverage investments and make them either longer term in nature or attempt to make them permanent, in which case they would have to find offsets within the finance committee's jurisdiction in order to pay for that over time. We may also see a discussion about public option. We may see a discussion there about potentially offsets around drug pricing or, you know, rescinding the rebate rule. I think there are going to be a lot of conversations to see, you know, what's politically palatable plus what's yeah. doable under the constraints of the bird rule. So let me start. Let me, this, this was, that was exactly, that was a really important point for our community because right now in President Biden's outline for what he would like to see in um, the various bills that come out of this process, he's not including um, many dollars at all for NIH research of any kind. It's very limited to research that is pretty much immediately needed for what happens after you have COVID, um, for health effects right after COVID. Basically, um, other research interests we know that the, the uh, institutes have are not included in his draft. And I think it's for that very reason that you're talking about is that they've defined this as what needs to happen right now for patients right this very second yeah. um, and, the, and, the, and the, the nation right this very second. And so Ellie, that actually, you know, triggers, I, I, should, I should mention, um, you know, traditionally reconciliation is used for mandatory spending programs mandatory. and revenues. We have an unusual situation here where we are turning what would ordinarily be discretionary appropriated funds, you know, carried out through the appropriations committee and sort of shoehorning them through the authorizing committees who are being instructed instead. And that is partly because I think maybe only once in the history of reconciliation has the appropriations committee ever been instructed, received an instruction, and it was for rescissions, not for spending. And so nobody really in the modern era of reconciliation is considered how that would work. Um, uh, so, you, but we may see an effort on that in FY22. But the other important thing is we have already met the FY21 discretionary spending cap. Oh man. And so to appropriate funds for FY21 would run afoul of that cap and it's a 60 vote point of order that would be against the bill. And that is very problematic. So that's, why they decided to go this route of moving the funding through the authorizing committees rather than the appropriations committee. And the other thing I want to mention, um, I think everybody's probably aware that uh, FY21 is the last year of the BCA discretionary spending caps that are in statute. There are no caps in place for FY22 and FY23. We may see a debate um, later this spring and into the summer about setting spending caps for FY22 and possibly FY23 as well. Um, I think there's potential interest on both sides um, to, to sort of you know, achieve balance between defense and non-defense spending, uh, allow some room for some new, from new spending, perhaps for NIH or other research priorities, and, and to sort of lock that in yeah, via yeah. statutory spending caps that are newly set later this year. And Sarah, so for FY21, does that mean that if there is funding for NIH, for example, it would have to be mandatory spending or that comes out of an authorizing committee or um, direct appropriations? So What's the process? Could, you could certainly see outside of the reconciliation bill, so separate from the reconciliation bill, um, perhaps an emergency supplemental appropriations bill moving that oh. might include some funding for NIH. I have not oh. heard anybody talk about that specifically, but it's hypothetically possible. Um, and that would move forward, you know, through regular order, which would require 60 votes in the Senate. And you can include an emergency spending designation that allows them to sort of get around the, oh. the FY21 spending cap that would otherwise exist. So that's a big deal. So this process, you're saying you're not going to see funding for federal agencies in this process. You will see funding that is going to federal agencies in the reconciliation process. Absolutely. It will not go through the regular appropriations committee. There's certainly funding that will go to the FDA, um, you know, CDC, various agencies. Okay. Um, We'll, and we'll and we'll know exactly where they're headed with this next week when they unveil um, at, in the House committees their okay. documents. Um, 
but in terms of a big increase for NIH funding. For no, no, no. We won't see that funding. here. Yeah, we won't see that here. We might, we, we may see that though during the FY22 budget resolution debate. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Well, this has been incredibly helpful. We'll be talking a little more about the process by which supplemental funding or funding in general for our concern about uh, research relief could, could happen. Um, but I guess, Sarah, do you think we, if we should transition over to Rob for yeah. now and we'll take yeah. uh, questions and answers on uh, for both? Okay, sounds that great. sounds great. Sure. Um, but, hi, Rob Smith with Capital Alpha Partners. Sarah, that was uh, fascinating. I was uh, great to... Great to hear your thoughts and thanks very much to Research America for, for having me here today. Um, I've been asked to talk through drug pricing, uh, specifically the most favored nations rule that's now uh, been held up in court. Um, and then uh, it gives a little bit of the uh, legislative outlook for, um, for FDA sort of around the uh, user fee reauthorization and then the 21st century cures uh, 2.0 effort that's, uh, that's ongoing. Um, so to start with, with drug pricing, um, just sort of big picture, uh, the Biden administration, I mean, their, their approach is going to be different than uh, the Trump administration's um, in, this, in this area. Uh, drug pricing was a huge campaign issue for Trump. Um, it's something that he, you know, was very adamant that he had to have some sort of victory um, during his administration. He really sort of drove HHS, Alex Azar, um, to, uh, to come up with drug pricing solutions. And, you know, as everybody knows that that sort of came to a head around the most favored nations um, rule that they uh, issued as an interim final rule um, right before uh, right before the election. Um, but, you know, I, I think from Biden's perspective, I mean, his number one, two, and three priorities are COVID. Um, and really, I think from the party as a whole, you know, they're, they're much more interested in things like coverage expansion and lowering uh, beneficiaries out of pocket costs rather than you know, uh, addressing drug prices directly, which is what, what Trump wanted to do. So um, I think at the end of the day, it'll be um, probably, you know, a, a, it's a favorable change for the drug industry. Um, I, I think we're on sort of more of a standard uh, Washington uh, footing now. Um, obviously, some big differences between the, you know, the two men's uh, governing philosophies there. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I think it's it's overall it's it's positive for the drug industry and gives a bit more predictability to the space going forward. Um, that's not to say that they don't face risks. I mean, certainly we have, uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, the potential for drug pricing offsets as part of the reconciliation packages, and maybe we could get into the specifics of that, um, you know, maybe in, in Q and A. Um, but you know, I, I think from the, at least the administrative perspective, it is it is favorable. Um, as for the the MFN, the Most Favored Nations Rule itself. So that has been enjoined now by two federal courts. Um, and basically the way that it stands is that uh, until or unless the Biden administration, and this is under court order, um, issues that rule through the standard notice and comments um, process, then it will remain enjoined. Um, and you can, uh, it, unless the Biden administration tends to, or uh, chooses to do something proactive to reissue that rule, again, through the standard notice and comment period, which um, Trump skipped by uh, issuing it as an interim final rule, um, right. it's going to be held up in court. Um, and there's no you know, hard and fast rule that it has to be addressed uh, by a certain date. I mean, if you look at the, um, for example, the Obama um, dialysis third party payment disclosure rule that was issued right at the end of his administration, um, similar circumstances where the courts ruled that um, they had violated the Administrative Procedures Act by issuing that as an interim final rule, right. said, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, right. The order was enjoined um, and uh, it was never acted on by the Trump administration. And so right. it, it essentially just went away. So I think that that's, that's likely what's going to happen here. It's, from, uh, it's our understanding the administration, the Biden administration is not interested in, in picking up that Trump rule um, and then going through the process of Cleaning it up, um, there's some questions as to whether uh, that rule had overreached uh, CMMI, that's the demonstration office uh, at CMS, had overreached their authority. Um, so it's, it's likely that they would have to be um, pretty substantially revised. And then at the end of the day, you have, uh, you would have uh, Biden's uh, CMS spending time trying to rescue a rule that was, you know, very much issued as part of a, uh, a Trump campaign pledge. So, you know, for a lot of reasons, we think that that, that rule itself is likely to just remain 
um, held up and uh, will not go anywhere. Um, and I think from you know the Biden administration's point of view, it it it, it kind of makes sense to to wait a couple of years before you test out your own demonstration authority um, on drug pricing. Um, really, if if you go forward with a rule on on drug pricing or or any type of rule um, from the CMS perspective that would cut reimbursement or um, uh, have an effect on coverage, um, you CBO tends to build in the cost estimates for that uh, particular yes. rule to the baseline. Um, they give at least 50% credit um, for uh, that rule, the budgetary impacts of that rule. So you could have a situation where Biden comes out with a you know, drug pricing demo, and then that in turn affects Congress's ability to use drug pricing measures as an offset because you get less of a score from CBO. So um, really, I, I think it's, it behooves them to, to wait a little bit on, on trying to do anything on the, on the demonstration side. And, and typically that's how it works out anyway, is that you, know, you, you try to get as much of your agenda through on a legislative basis as you can, and then sort of you turn to regulation um, if that doesn't work. So uh, I think we're, we're fairly clear, at least on the, on the regulatory side for drug pricing for, for the time being. So that's, that's positive. Um, um, Pudufa and Madufa, um, I, I think that, you know, really what we're going to need to see is, you know, who is the FDA commissioner going to be? Um, the FDA has a, as you all know, it has a, has a huge role in negotiating uh, that package. Um, it tends to be a vehicle for, uh, you know, FDA policy items. Um, it's likely to be merged even with that, um, the Cures Medical Innovation effort. Um, so I think really who, who Biden chooses for FDA commissioners is going to really sort of set the tone for those negotiations and, um, you know, it's going to be a really important factor. So as you guys know, I mean, Joshua Sharstein, Sharstein is, uh, is one of the top contenders. Um, he's a former deputy commissioner um, under Obama. Sorry, the bill's being delivered. My dog is going crazy if anybody can hear that. <laughs> um, uh, deputy commissioner under Obama, um, and he's generally not, not very favorably viewed by um, either the drug or device industry. Um, do you remember during the Obama um, administration, he led an effort to uh, redo the 510k um, medical device approval process, um, and that wasn't really uh, met with much enthusiasm uh, within the agency or certainly from, from Congress. Um, and uh, he has written recently in, in op-eds about the need to uh, reform and uh, re-examine the abbre abbreviated approval processes um, and tracks that are available um, for, for drugs through FDA. Um, so I, I think that that would be kind of a negative. I think it would sort of set him up for, uh, set FDA up for maybe a more adversarial um, relationship with industry. Um, on the other hand, you have Janet Woodcock, um, who is currently serving as the um, uh, acting commissioner um, before Biden makes his uh, final pick for the, you know, the full nomination. Um, you know, I, I think everybody's probably familiar with her. She's a, you know, 40 year veteran of the agency, um, has done uh, very well as far as, you know, utilizing those abbreviated pathways. Um, there, I think she would, should have good industry support. I think she, she could be confirmed on a bipartisan basis, um, whereas uh, Sharpstein um, might have some, some issues from Republicans and maybe even some device state um, Democrats as well. Um, the, the biggest knock against her that I've seen so far was uh, a group of uh, 10 senators, I believe, or wait, um, I'm, I apologize, that was another issue, um, a, a patient groups uh, who have written to the administration um, saying that, uh, you know, questioning her fitness because of her uh, involvement in the approval of, uh, you know, several opioids uh, during her, during her track. Um, I, FDA has also taken, you know, a lot of steps to help combat the opioid crisis as well. Um, so I think she could point to that. She certainly testified on these issues um, in Congress before. So it's not, you know, some sort of new skeleton in the closet thing that's come up. So um, I think that if, uh, if, if Biden does indeed choose her for the full nomination, that that wouldn't be enough to sink her candidacy. Um, and then, you know, just moving on to, to, to cures, um, I, I think that's going to be a really, really important package and that they are, the Congress is likely to use that as a vehicle for all sorts of things, um, particularly around the pandemic. Um, you know, we have uh, FDA is absolutely a watch in real world evidence and uh, post marketing data from. I mean, if you look at the just the vast yeah. number of tests that have been approved on an emergency use authorization basis. Um, that uh, essentially you're looking at just a whole sea of post market data where there wasn't a lot of pre market evaluation that happened. Um, you know, before those tests reached the market. So. 
um, I think there's going to be a lot of focus on, you know, what did we learn here? How can we apply this to um, review processes in the for in, uh, going forward? And what do we need to fix? I mean, I think that this gives a real um, uh, impetus for finally acting on, um, you know, establishing a new uh, diagnostic center at FDA. That legislation has wow. been pending yeah. for like five, six, seven years. Um, I think that this is a, a real opportunity and pr like really clearly illuminates the, the need for that kind of a system. Okay. Rob, um, let me interrupt you for one second because um, one of our um, one of members of our audience um, made a comment that actually reflects one that was going through my head. I just wanted to clarify that the, the letter to Dr. Woodcock was from consumer groups. Um, the patient community, there's been um, some very strong support for Dr. Woodcock expressed by that community. So yes. you would think it's the same community, which always is disturbing to me because, but, but there's right. separate. Um, gotcha. I just wanted yep. to clarify. Yep, my mistake. My mistake. You know, no problem um, at all. Yeah, <laughs> and certainly, I mean, on the, on the patient side, I mean, if, if you look at um, her approval of um, the Sarepta DMD drug, I mean, that that won her a lot of credit. Um, it was it was a it was a controversial decision, and I think that really did win her a lot of credit with patient groups. So. I, I think she um, she keeps her eye on the patient and and um, has um, a, so much integrity in very difficult decision making that yeah. um, you know she's yeah I, I'm, checks a lot I'm, checks a lot of boxes for yes, sure. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so that was, that was about it on, um, on, on cures. Again, I think it's going to be a pretty substantial package. I mean, there's obviously a lot to do uh, examining a lot of those waivers that CMS has come out with as well, particularly for, for telehealth and trying to figure out, you know, what needs to be extended, what needs to be made permanent. Um, how do we need to, you know, sort of change reimbursement around, um, around those types of services. So, um, it should be, it should be an interesting year and the, <laughs> um, user fees need to be reauthorized by the end of 2022. So, um, there's, uh, time is of the essence. So. So it's by the end of calendar year, fiscal, uh, fiscal year, year, 2022? Fiscal year. Yes. Fiscal okay. Year. So. so yeah, so that by hook or by croup. So how about Madufa? So how about the medical device? So Padufa is the one that you're talking about now. Is Madufa on yeah, the same time frame? Yeah, it's on the same, it's on the same track, on the same track. So okay. um, yeah. So then um, you'll have the generic drug user fees are in there as well. So. And animal drugs, some. I, th that I believe that's a, di I believe that's a different, the different track. Yeah. Track. So, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, thanks so much, Rob. Um, uh, we're going to have um, Terry Schwartzbeck from our team ask questions. I'm going to, as usual, dominate just for a minute or two and ask each of you a question. Sarah, once the um, budget resolution, if it's passed, passes, is there any sense of the time frame where the authorizing committees do their work? And I mean, could you, is that, has that been, is there a goal? Yes, there is a goal and it's specified as part of the reconciliation instructions. Um, the authorizing committees are supposed to report back to the budget committees by February 16th. Um, so we are expecting the House is going to start marking up next week, the House, House authorizing committees, and they will move to complete action by sort of third week, possibly fourth week of February and send that over to the Senate. The Senate authorizing committees are actually not going to end up taking action. They're just going to go straight to taking up that house passed bill. Oh, and, okay. you know, I heard, um, you know, some, you know, members of the budget and finance committee suggesting they hope to be done by March 7th in the Senate um, and provided they don't make any amendments to the house bill that gets sent over that can get straight sent straight to the president's desk. Otherwise, it has to go back to the House for another vote before it goes to the president's desk for signature. March 22nd. And is your expectation that if they launch an FY22 budget resolution to try to do some of this longer term mm -hmm. work, that that would happen after the whole first process is done? Or will it Correct. start? Yes, okay. I think they will give everybody a short breather. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and it's still unclear when the president is going to send up his FY22 budget. Um, you know, typically in the first year of an administration, uh, you know, there's a there's a quote unquote statutory deadline to send it up, send it up the first Monday in February. Nobody ever, you know, that is rarely met even in normal years. Um, but in the first year of an administration, usually they're delayed by, you know, three weeks or more. In this case, they may actually want to hold back on sending up the budget until the 
first COVID relief plan has been signed into law because they're probably going to want to incorporate those numbers into their budget that they're sending that makes out. Sense. So you could see possibly, although this is all, you know, loosey goosey, nobody knows for sure. Um, you could see them sending something up late March, maybe early April, and then a budget resolution process could kick off for FY22, maybe sometime in April or May. Again, there's a quote unquote statutory deadline of deadline. adopting a budget resolution by April 15th, but you know, that is rarely met, so. And let me just clarify, I think I confuse things so much asking about whether the, um, one of the big interests um, for the research ecosystem is this gap in funding that was created by COVID erosion and um, not all bad, it was reprogramming towards COVID research, but it was also just stalled research, clinical trials stopped mm -hmm. dead. Um, so in theory, those are, those are dollars for NIH, but you said that they could, it's not gonna happen, what we're not gonna see is an annual increase of, in NIH in this, in FY21 through the authorizing committees. But there is a mechanism by which there could be funding for NIH through the authorizing committees. Yes, you mean in this first package, in this first, first package. package. Yes, it is very, it is possible that they could include funding for NIH. And what yeah. would that actually be called? Would that be called uh, direct appropriations or mandatory? Yes. Does it have Basically a name? Basically similar to direct spending. It's direct, direct spending, spending or a, man, a mandatory appropriation that's essentially done through the authorizing. And you would see that, um, you know, through the, the reconciliation uh, legislation that's produced by the Energy and Commerce Committee, because they have, I think, primary perhaps. Yes, they do. They NIH. have an NIH CDC ARC. Yeah. Um, exactly. so, so, yeah, so going to be in there, yeah, so if anything is going to be in there, you'll see that coming out of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Perfect. Um, Rob, you know, you, I don't know that you mentioned, and it might be because it does feel like right now we're in a, a period of inaction on anything, um, on the policy pieces uh, that affect industry and patients specifically. Mm -hmm. But has there been any talk about 340B at all, the 340B program for hospitals? And Yeah, um, that is a, uh, we have long said that that is a, an area that is really ripe for reform. Um, it's, it's been very, very difficult to address um, in the past. I know uh, Energy and Commerce took a look at it and, uh, you know, you get one of those areas where you get, you know, pharma against hospitals. And, it's really uh, tough. It's yeah. really, really tough to deal with. So um, I think that, that that is an area that, that Congress might be pushed to legislate on. I mean, you, you do have a couple of court cases that are that are pending now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a real conflict where you have essentially pharmaceutical companies refusing to, to give the discounts. And you know, you're in the situation where um, you know, Aspie uh, likely doesn't have the authority to you know, fully crack down or, you know, enforce 340B policy. So there's a, you know, I think a, a real need to create some additional authority and, and you know, that'll be a vehicle for perhaps some additional changes to the, to the program. Um, sure. My partner, sure. Kim Monk covers that more in depth than oh, I do. Oh, okay, then I am but, not um, gonna harass you on this particular no, no, issue. No, <laughs> harass away and we're, we're always, <laughs> then, always happy to chat Then I won't be belying my, my ignorance. Um, Terry, let me, um, let me um, ask you to see if we have questions from our audience. Oh, we sure do. And awesome. uh, just a reminder to folks that you can type those in the box that says Q&A. <clears throat> One question we have regarding the spending caps, why would the House and Senate majorities want to impose BCA caps, uh, Sarah, which you mentioned might reappear? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, so I think it's important to remember that the appropriations bills uh, still have to move through regular order, which means they require 60 votes uh, to, to pass in the Senate. So Democrats and Republicans are going to have, ne have to negotiate um, around not only what are the th what's the 302A, the sort of top line funding level um, for the appropriators, but then also, you know, how are we going to divvy that up between defense and non-defense? And then how do we divvy it up for the 302Bs? Um, because there's going to have to be a negotiation, um, I suspect that Republicans will push the advantage of wanting to have caps. And I think that there is amongst some Democrats an interest in having caps, not necessarily for the discipline per se of having a, 
a number, um, but more to ensure that there is parity between defense and non-defense spending. That makes a lot of sense. Great, thank you. And another question, um, can you talk a little more about what reserve funds are in this context? Um, and can they, uh, can they get money to CDC and FDA as mandatory funding? I think Ellie touched on this a little. Yes, so reserve funds um, can, I mean, you can write a reserve fund for virtually any spending priority on the planet. So the answer to that is yes, you could do that. Um, I think the challenge is the authorizing committees, um, particularly for programs that are typically appropriated, um, you know, via the appropriations committee, tend to really only authorize future appropriations and not do mandatory spending. So hypothetically, you absolutely could write a reserve fund that would allow for you know, the help and the energy and commerce committees to move forward legislation that, that's mandatory in nature. Um, the, the challenge is uh, it sets up a big fight between the appropriators and the authorizers. And um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to others to decide who would always win in that fight. <laughs> Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Ellie, did you have any further questions? Um, no, I, you know, if we, anyone from our audience wants to um, go ahead of me, that's, that's fine. I always have a million, so. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we did just get another one um, for that potential new diagnostic center at the FDA that Rob, you mentioned. Um, is there any other legislation on this issue outside of the Ballot Act? And are you still expecting Senator Burr to sponsor that legislation? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think you, you have to really look at, at energy and commerce's uh, effort um, there. I think they've, they've, done, they've done sort of the, the bulk of the, the lifting as far as bringing a coalition together of you know, labs and diagnostics manufacturers. I mean, they, they haven't always uh, seen eye to eye on this issue. So um, I, I think they're, they're the real ones to watch. And, and certainly uh, Senator Burr is going to be very key there. Um, Senator Alexander, the former chair of the um, health committee, was not interested in this new center at all. Um, he was uh, afraid of its impact on uh, academic medical research centers yeah. um, and uh, in, in academic labs. So um, I, I think that there's more of a potential for that to, for that to move now that, that Alexander's gone. And there was some thought, you know, prior to his retirement that, you know, maybe this is you, sh you should move this while he's there, while he could have, you know, a bit of control over the, um, over the outcome. Um, so now I, I think with, with Burr there, um, it just, it's another reason why um, that could, you know, finally happen. Rob, let me ask you about another um, piece of legislation or pieces of legislation dealing with trying to spur the antibiotics pipeline. So there have been a couple of efforts in that regard because of antibiotic, um, antimicrobial resistance. Do you, have you heard any word about that as something that might be included in 21st century cures or that's getting any traction? Yeah, I think that would, uh, that would make sense. Um, honestly, I mean, they've, they've talked about those issues so, so often over the years and it's just sort of like, a, um, you know, each year there's another effort to, to try to get um, one of those through. So um, I, I think it'll, it'll be in the mix. Um, I'm not sure yet if that's going to have, you know, Which more of a chance. Yeah, yeah, I've heard the, that there's the some new, newer ideas kind of that are floating that are really very interesting. So hopefully it'll, it'll um, and will help uh, bring I, it to there. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, it's, uh, that's, it's, it's a great vehicle. Um, so I think it would make sense to, to take it in there. So. Great, well, let me take the first, the last minute we have to talk a little bit just for a second about supplemental funding and what Research America has been up to with the help of our Alliance members. We have gathered a more than 120, 130 um, examples, um, insights, quotes about the impact of COVID-19 on our research ecosystem, on uh, early career investigators, um, on the whole career ladder, but most importantly on patients um, because of stalled research that will not be able to start again or research that won't get the next grant because there are no findings from this research. And people are dying today from illnesses like Alzheimer's and cancer. So it is an emergency situation. We have um, written a letter just as a, a frame for your comments and your examples. We're sending that to um, congressional leadership, uh, appropriations leadership and the Biden administration today. Um, you'll see it either today or in Mary's weekly letter tomorrow. And um, 
Then we've also um, launched, and I think you probably have it in your inboxes, a very short survey asking questions about the impact of COVID on your research. Um, if you are a researcher or in a research institution, all of this information is anonymized. Is that even a word? Um, De-identified, <laughs> but has been very useful, very instructive. And I think we're showing that um, this is real and it is urgent. And just like every life is urgent and patients are waiting. Um, so I just wanted to give you a big thank you and give you an update on what's happening and you'll see this in your inboxes. So um, on that, let me thank you, Sarah and Rob, so much for joining us. You know we'll tap you again. <laughs> um, but this has been so helpful in so many ways. And, um, and again, thanks to our members. Thank you, as always, for being um, such great partners with us. Okay. Bye now.